Hello, and welcome to How to Write a Technical Resume. My name is Rachel Wilbrack. I work for the University Career Center. I'm a program director specifically working with our College of Computer, Mathematical, and Natural Sciences. If you've ever seen anything that says it's from the UCC at CMNS or the University Career Center at CMNS, that's me. So we're gonna kind of start off with resumes in general and some important things that you need to think about before you write a resume. Some things you wanna think about. What's the purpose? So is this a resume that you're using to get an internship, to get a full-time job? Is this a resume that you're submitting to go along with your application to graduate school? Um, is it to get a fellowship or a scholarship? There's a lot of different reasons why you might update your resume. Who is the intended reader? Second thing, right? So is this a resume that you think um, the hiring manager who has an understanding of your technical skills um, is going to see? Is this a resume that someone, um, maybe that's serving as a writer for a letter of recommendation for graduate school is gonna see? Depending on who this resume is for, might change how you decide to write your resume or what things go on your resume and what order, that kind of thing. And then what message do you wanna send is the last question to think about. Um, if this is a resume that you're writing for a software engineering internship, that might look very different than, an in, than a resume that you're trying to write for a part-time job on campus that has little to do with maybe your technical skills. So elements of a resume. If you've written one before, chances are these things will be pretty familiar to you. Your heading, that's your name, that's your contact information, that might be um, the links to your GitHub or your LinkedIn account, any of that kind of thing. And that's usually big and at the top. Your education, of course, is gonna be the next thing on there. You'll have the University of Maryland and any other institutions of higher education that you have attended. Um, if it's something where you went somewhere for a year and transferred, you don't necessarily have to list them, although you can. If you received a degree from somewhere else before coming to Maryland, you definitely want to list that. So if you got your associate somewhere, that degree and that institution should be on here with Maryland above it in your current um, degree program that you're seeking. Now for a technical resume, I usually recommend that your skills section be the next section. On some res resumes, you'll see it at the bottom but because technical skills are highly sought after, um, th that's something that you're gonna to wanna to show an employer quickly. It also gives them a chance to quickly scan through and see what programming languages, um, what systems do you know how to use, um, what things will you be able to bring to the table that they can scan through quickly. And then if they see, oh, we want someone who knows Java, they can then look at your experience sections and maybe see how you've used Java. So that brings me to the next section or sections of your resume. And that's gonna be experience sections that might include campus and community involvement. Um, really, there's a lot of different names that you can give an experience or many experience sections. It might depend on how you choose to highlight the experiences you've had. Um, but remember, this can be things like internships, this can be part-time jobs, uh, this can also be volunteer opportunities. These do not have to be opportunities um, that you were just paid for. Uh, employers, you know, don't really care if you were employed for the experience on your resume or not, if you were paid. They want to know that you have the experience that they're looking for. So whether you did that for free for someone or someone paid you to do it, doesn't matter. They want to see that you have that experience. Class projects can be a way to show experience if you haven't had some of those part-time or internship opportunities yet. Um, Side projects can be even better. Side projects or in some cases like personal projects, you might hear me refer to them as. Um, the difference being that if you're doing a side project or a personal project, this is you going above and beyond taking an initiative to try to do a project that wasn't assigned in a class, right? It's not something you had to do. It's something that you chose to do. Um, class projects are definitely essential if you don't have other experience, relevant experience to show an employer. Um, but remember that everyone else in your class is doing those same projects. So if you have side projects or personal projects that you've worked on on your own time, that can be a little bit more impressive. Um, of course, study abroad opportunities could be in any of these experience sections that you decide to create 
leadership opportunities, awards and honors, potentially teaching, tutoring, really anything that has given you an experience or a skill that, empl that an employer might be interested in could be something that's in an experience section on a resume. So let's go back and start going through some of these sections. With education, I mentioned before, you wanna have, um, you know, the University of Maryland's gonna be the first thing at the top, you're gonna include the degree and the major. Be sure that you're listing the full name of the degree. So that might be Bachelor of Science, comma, Computer Science. So you might do Bachelor of Science in Computer Science. Um, either of those is fine. Obviously, if you're not Computer Science, insert your major there. You just don't wanna say bachelor's in computer science or majoring in computer science. You wanna actually mention the full name of the degree and then your major. University of Maryland, of course, is going to be listed. You wanna list the expected graduation date. I sometimes see people that will list um, like when they came to Maryland, like their first semester, and sometimes they'll do it to present or they'll do it to a graduation date. Employers really just wanna see your graduation date because if they see that it's the current semester, they'll know you're graduating and probably expecting a full-time position. If they see that it's more than two semesters away, they'll assume you're probably looking for an internship. If you have a GPA over a 3.0, I would highly recommend listing it. If you don't, you could still list it if you want. Uh, it's kind of up to you. Um, I've heard both um, kind of reasonings. Like if it's under a 3.0 and you don't list it, like do people automatically assume that it's under a 3.0 and you don't have time to explain it or show what it is? Um, or will people assume that it's worse than it is? I'm not sure. I find that if it's above a 3.0, you just definitely wanna show it off. If it's under and they're really concerned about GPA and you don't list it, my guess is if they're willing to take someone under a 3.0, they're gonna ask you what it is, um, which then might open up the door for you to have a conversation as to why it's maybe a little bit lower um, and maybe there's a reason for that um, versus if you list that you have, you know, a 2.6 and they just see 2.6 and don't give you the chance to talk about it and kind of move on. So remember with your education, um, you want to stand out, well, from, with everything, not just your education, but you want to stand out from the crowd. So keep in mind that everyone from your major will have the same general classes or projects. I mentioned this before with the difference between class projects and side projects, but lots of times I see students that want to list every single class they've taken in their major, which is fine. There's nothing wrong with it inherently. I think experience speaks more strongly to your skill level and what you can do. Um, but remember, like if an employer or whoever's looking at your resume sees that you are a computer science major, they're going to assume you've taken computer science courses, right? So what I would say is if you want to list classes, think about maybe higher level classes or classes that are more unique um, to Maryland or maybe ones that not every single student at Maryland takes like it was a more niche area of computer science or whatever your degree program is um, or if you're applying to a very specific type of role and this class is very related um, to that role then it might make sense to say okay well I'm going to list my couple of cybersecurity classes that I took in this area because that's really related to the type of job I'm applying to you don't necessarily need to list every single class. So with experience, you wanna be detailed but concise when you're writing bullet points to talk about what you did in those experiences. You always wanna start with a strong action verb. So this means avoiding words like helped or assisted or worked, because those could really be anything and that's not the skill you're trying to show them. In most cases, you're not trying to show them that your skill is that you can assist someone else. Usually it's whatever comes after that. So if you're saying that you assisted in the development of a program that did X, Y, and Z, what you really did was you developed the program that did X, Y, and Z. Now I understand sometimes you also want to make sure you're not taking full credit for something that might be was a group project, but you could easily say developed a program with three other coders that did X, Y, Z. So keep that in mind. Um, also quantifying your experience whenever you can use a number or an amount of money or a percentage those are all good things to help highlight your skills. This could be, you know, increasing the efficiency of something by 50% or, you know, if we're talking about a student organization that you brought in, you know, 30 new members, like that's a way to kind of show money or if you've raised money or saved a company money because you created something for them that meant they didn't have to spend their money on something else, always you could potentially show um, those numbers. 
Remember, um, when you're writing about your experience in your resume, um, thinking about would an outsider understand your experience and impact? This kind of goes back to one of those first questions. We said, who's the intended reader? Um, if you know or have an idea of who's gonna see it, um, that can change the way you talk about your experience. Or if you know that you're talking about a program or a project that you had to work on that they may not understand, thinking about how you word your bullet points to have that strong action verb and tell them what you did, but also kind of explaining the project at the same time, potentially. Your experience bullet points. You really wanna to try to make them sound like an accomplishment list. You don't wanna just sound like you copy and pasted the job description um, into your resume. So again, if you can say ways that you created new things or help them be more efficient or solved a problem, those are gonna read more like accomplishments than just simply reading off your job description. Um, again, coming back to numbers, highlighting the positive impact that you've made, if you've increased productivity um, by doing something or saved an organization money, all good things to mention. I mentioned before that listing projects can be a way to show your experience. Um, think not just about what the project um, was assigned to do, but like what specifically was your role? You don't wanna say what the whole group did if it was a group project. You wanna talk specifically also about like, what did you do? Were you the leader? Were you someone who was in charge of the presentation afterwards or the paper that was associated with it? Or are you in charge of coding this one section? Like pointing out specifically what part you did in the greater context of the project is also something that they're gonna to wanna to know. And then of course, be honest. If you were a cashier, there's no one shame in saying you were a cashier. That's what you should put. You know, you don't wanna fluff up the title and say, that you know you were an executive in charge of monetary transactions like first of all they're going to be like what the heck is that and then once they figure out from reading your um bullet points that you were a cashier they're going to wonder why you were trying to exaggerate or fluff up the title um remember that a lot of the recruiters or the people that might hire you have been in positions like you they've had part-time jobs or they've been parts of student organizations and they're going to see some of those things and they're going to resonate with, with that um, you know, if you were a resident assistant, there are plenty of people that are now in the working world that are resident assistant and might see that in your resume and be like, oh my gosh, like I remember being an RA. This was my craziest story or, you know, thing that happened. Like, what are some of the things like you can bond over that? I've seen people that bond over, um, you know, the restaurant that they worked at or the type of store, retail store that they worked at or something like that because they know how hard it was working there, even though it was just you know, a part-time job that many people may not think is as relevant to what you're applying to, but they remember like the skills that they learned from doing that job, and they now associate those skills with you. Um, so remember, you wanna be honest, you don't wanna exaggerate, but also sometimes it can work in your favor if the right person sees that experience. So if you went above and beyond on a project, you wanna make sure that you say so. So going back to like talking about your role in a project, if when working on a project, you were the person who wrote the paper, talk about that. If the project you know, led to a competition in your class where your group received the top award or top ranking, make sure that you say that. Um, being selected as the you know, top project in the class or even the second, be something to show that your project was better than others is a way to quantify how well you did. Um, same thing, if you've been given any promotions, that could be a bullet point, promoted to X position from this position. Um, if you're promoted, that means the people that you are working for like the work that you're doing, they think you're doing a good job, and they wanna keep you. And to an employer, that's a good thing. They want employer employees that they feel the same way about. Um, don't forget that you can include volunteer work. Um, again, just because you don't get paid for it doesn't mean that it can't go on there. Um, leadership experiences, whether that's at you know, your church or cheerleading or a club or a sport, um, you know, student organization, whatever it is, put it down. If you've made an impact in that organization, you know, it's something beyond just attending meetings, that's, that's a way that you can show your impact or the work or the skills that you have. That's something worth mentioning. Um, Think too, like, have you done any fundraising um, or large pro pro projects? Can you share that you raised a certain amount of money, increased membership, planned an event? You know, this is a way that you can talk about transferable skills 
um, that come from experiences that may not be as obviously related as, you know, the computer science internship you have. There are a lot of different ways that you can show that you've gained skills in teamwork or communication or other skills that all employers are looking for. And they don't have to just come from the most obviously related experiences. All right, so writing an effective resume. Um, this is an example of a resident assistant. If you've lived on campus or even if you haven't, you probably know what a resident assistant has done. If you look at that top example, um, being responsible for residents, planning programs, advise hall council, all things are probably true, right? Um, in most cases, it doesn't look super impressive. Hopefully in watching this, we can all agree um, that the bottom one looks a little bit more impressive. They go into a little bit more detail. They list some numbers. Um, you know, it's still kind of the same thing. So they counsel and are responsible for 60 residents and then on the specific issues that they are responsible for helping those residents. Um, instead of just saying planning programs, it says that they planned eight educational programs each semester and then some of the topics that they covered. Um, advising Hall Council and maybe a budget that was associated with that. Um, you know, both are technically correct, but the second one looks a little bit more impressive because the person has gone into a little bit more detail and given a little bit more context for the experience that they've had. So you're just kind of beefing up that resume a little bit. So while the same thing is true, the bottom one just looks a little better. And so that's what you should kind of aim for. All right, so talking about your technical skills and your resume, as I mentioned, this could be a section um, right under education towards the top of your resume. Um, list all technical programs, languages, skills that you feel comfortable using. Don't list anything that you've just heard about or you may be only used for you know, one small project and you don't really know well. Um, you want to be confident that the skills that you're putting onto your resume are things that if they ask you about them, you feel comfortable talking about them, answering questions, or sharing that experience. Like if it's something you haven't really used, you don't want to put it on your resume. Um, if you've used a specific program or language for a significant amount of time, be sure to note that too. Like if you have an extensive experience in a specific programming language and you feel really confident with it, that's a good thing to show to employers. Just remember, if it's on your resume, it's fair game. So expect people to ask about it. That's why I kind of say like, if it's a program that you've heard of, but you haven't really used it, probably best not to list it. Um, you don't want them to start asking you questions and find out that you don't know as much about it as they think you're claiming on your resume because they might've been okay with you not knowing that program or language, but the second they think that you're putting it on your resume and lying about it is where it can be a problem. So list the specific technology used to complete projects in their description. So in this case, what I mean is, if you have all your programming languages at the top of your resume, find ways to then show how you've used those programming languages in your projects. So whether that's the projects, that, a section that you have in your resume, or if they're listed in your, um, in your experience, or you've had an internship where you use that language, you know, simply listing it in the description is fine, but they're gonna wanna know how well you know it. And being able to show where you've used those on what projects will help to do that. And again, coming back to the not over-exaggerating or putting something that you don't know super well on your resume, don't claim to be an expert or, exam or advanced if you aren't. Um, it's good practice you know, to put your skill level, so whether it's basic or proficient, advanced, some experience, et cetera. Um, but you don't wanna say you're an expert or advanced in something unless you seriously are, because you say expert or advanced and they start quizzing you on it and they don't think you're up to the level that they think an expert or an advanced person would be, again, it just makes, it just kind of calls into question the other things on your resume. And then they wonder, okay, well, if they're exaggerating about this, what else are they exaggerating about? And you don't want them to think about that and, and you in that way when they're looking at your resume. So let's say you still need some experience. Let's say that you haven't had that first internship yet um, and you feel like you need to find some other things to get on here um, that help. Um, remember, again, it doesn't just have to be an internship or a paid opportunity. If you volunteer, um, that can be a way. We talked about projects and things like that, um, whether they're class projects or side projects, but um, you know, volunteering, 
um, to something that's similar to your interests or shows your pa passion for technology can be really helpful. Um, if you're not sure that you can completely start your own project, you have no idea what kind of project you'd even want to do if you started your own, um, take a past project, take a class project and maybe improve upon it, right? Um, if there were three things that you had to program to make something do and you can add extra things um, that that project or that code can do, that's a start. Um, or making it more efficient than the first time you made it. Anything that you can do to kind of improve upon a past project can be a way to kind of show again that you're taking initiative and going above and beyond what was initially assigned in class. Um, the other thing that you could think about doing is choosing a job that's more related to your field of interest. Um, so for argument's sake, if you are really interested in um, doing research within computer science and you just haven't found your in yet, you haven't found a professor to work with, um, but you know that there's a job working part-time as a student assistant within the computer science department, that might be a way to, you know, make some money and also potentially get to know some more faculty and staff in the department. As you get closer to this interest um, and working with some of these people, you will get to know new professors and potentially find new ends to find opportunities to do research. So it may not start off as the most obviously related or relevant, but could potentially help you to create those connections that can get you to the position that you're looking to get into. Um, and finally, don't let a lack of experience stop you. It's certainly frustrating, and we've all heard, you know, the idea that it takes experience to get experience. Um, you know, trying to find experience and not finding it, you know, right away can be frustrating, but the more that you work at it and talk to people and make strides towards getting that experience, the closer you're going to get. Being frustrated and stopping looking isn't going to get you anywhere. All right, so here's a simple example, not perfect, um, but a simple example of what your resume could look like. You have your contact information at the top, education, um, you know, your Bachelor of Science in Computer Science at the University of Maryland. You then have the skills section. Now, this resume does not list um, experience level. That's something that this resume could change and they could say which ones they feel more proficient in or which ones are just beginner. You can see that they have their experience section labeled as programming experience because they wanted to specifically highlight their programming experience. So they have a part-time job on campus uh, as a student web developer, but then they also list personal projects and a couple of class projects to help fill in um, showing off how they can use specific programming languages and what they can do. Um, this is not a real person's resume. Um, this is one that was created, but just kind of to give you an idea of what uh, it could look like or how to format it. So some general resume tips, and these are true for all resumes, um, not just for technical resumes. Um, but typically we recommend sticking to a font size of 10 to 12 point font. You don't want it to be too small where someone has trouble reading it or too big that it looks like you're trying to make it a bigger font just to fill the page. Um, likewise, you can kind of play with the margins a little bit too. Go anywhere from a half inch to one inch, and that's on both sides, left and right, and top and bottom. So if you find that you are trying to kind of spit more onto your resume and you need a little more space, and you know, you're currently at a one inch margin and you're using a 12 point font, switching to a half inch margin and 10 point font will help you kind of squeeze more onto that page if you want. Or if you find you have too much white space at the bottom of your page and you're at the smaller end, you might find that it makes more sense to bump it up in font size or margins. So I mentioned this, a one page resume. For most of you, that's gonna be perfectly acceptable and fine. What I would say is keep your master resume, that's as many pages as you need it to be, and then you have everything written down, you know and can remember what months you worked in certain places or worked on certain projects. Um, but then you can kind of cut and paste that down to one page. And that is the one page that you're going to submit when you apply to things. So there are exceptions, of course, to that. If you are applying to the federal government, they kind of want to see anything and everything. So don't worry about sticking to the one page rule. If you're applying to graduate school, it can be more than one page. Um, if you are currently working on a graduate degree um, or you already have it, so if you already have a master's or a PhD and you're working on one of those things, um, 
then typically you might see more than a page. It might be about two pages. And of course, if you're looking at an academic role um, and you're doing a, you know, a CV, that can be any number of pages. But for the most part, one page is going to be sufficient, sufficient for most of you. Um, after you get through your sophomore year of college, high school experience should be taken off your resume. That's why it's important when you get to um, school to kind of start finding ways to get involved, um, looking for internships, looking for experiences, um, because high school stuff, you know, when you're starting your junior year starts to look a little old, a little less relevant. So unless you have something that's really impressive and highly relevant from high school, that stuff's going to come off after your sophomore year of college. Um, remember to kind of keep a clean and consistent format. Make it easy for employers to skim your resume and find the important information and avoid excessive white space because excessive white space will make your resume look very blank and will make it look like there's not a lot on there. So if you find you have a lot of white space, look back at the font size, the margins, also potentially look at are there new opportunities you can throw onto your resume or do you need to do a little beefing up of your descriptions of the way that you talk about your experience and the bullet points that you write. So here are a few tips from employers that I've gotten over the years. Um, list non-class projects that you've worked on. I talked about that a little bit earlier. Um, I have heard a couple employers that have um, disagreed with me on this second point, um, but most employers are not really interested in your hobbies um, unless it's something that's super related to the type of organization you're working for. So let's say um, you really love to travel. Most people like to travel. Um, but that might be relevant if you're, you know, applying to work at Travelocity or Expedia or something like that, right? Because then your interest is related to the type of work that you're ultimately supporting. Um, but for the most part, interests are things or hobbies are things that can come up in an interview maybe, um, but not necessarily on your resume, especially when there's going to be more relevant um, skills and experiences to share with that employer. Tailor your resume to the company and position. Now, if you are applying to a lot of very similar positions, you may not have to tailor your resume much. Because if they're asking for the same types of skills, there's really no reason to move things around. But like I talked about before, when you're thinking about what the purpose of the resume is or who the intended reader is, if you're applying to um, a part-time job on or off campus in a service industry, that resume is gonna look very differently than the programming position that you're applying to in an internship or a full-time job, right? Um, chances are that service industry position that you're picking up maybe just to make some extra money on the side is not gonna be interested necessarily in your coding experience. So you might reorder some things on your resume. But if you're applying to a lot of the same types of positions, don't be surprised if your resume looks fairly similar. And then be concise, try not to, um, give too much detail or give paragraphs for bullet points, really like one statement should be enough per bullet point. But you can have multiple bullet points, of course, under each experience. And then um, very briefly, a quote from an employer. Most students have worked on websites for student orgs, applications for departments on campus, and tons of personal side projects for fun that are actually pretty neat. The number one thing that makes a student stand out to me is not what they did in the classroom, but how they applied what they learned outside of the classroom. So again, this is why it's really important to be able to show like not just class projects, um, but eventually how you've taken what you've learned in class and use that outside of the classroom, whether that be personal projects, um, volunteer organizations, um, student orgs, internships, part-time jobs, full-time jobs, et cetera. So some takeaways from this. Um, again, it's not a simple job description that you're listing on your resume. You want to talk about your impact and the accomplishments that you've made in those positions. You want to find ways to set yourself apart. You don't want it to read like every other resume of the person behind you at the career fair, right? Or every other person who applied before or after you online. When possible, write every bullet point such that the reader can visualize you performing the task. Use those strong action verbs, like I mentioned before, to really share what you've done or how you've contributed. Don't just list things like worked, helped, assisted. That's not gonna give them a strong visual of what you can do, at least not right off the bat. You wanna catch their attention. Um, remember there's a chance that your resume can be scanned and for big companies that get a lot of resumes, 
it's very likely it will be scanned. Um, so use brand name words when it's you know appropriate. Um, make sure that the key skills that the job description is looking for are shown somehow on your resume because you want those things to stand out. And then pop at the top. Um, let's say you decide to divide your experience on your resume into two sections because you want to highlight your programming experience in one section and then your other transferable skills and experiences in another section. And you want to make sure that programming section is closer to the top, right? So you might have your education, then your skills, then your programming section, and then maybe your other experience section under it because you want them to see the most impressive stuff towards the top of your resume. All right, so here's some upcoming events, believe it or not. We're all virtual, we're working from home, but we do have some things coming up. So some upcoming events, we have um, a STEM diversity virtual career fair. Now this is not done by the University Career Center. This is not something the University of Maryland is doing. Um, it is done by Career Eco. It's an event that we've been made aware of, so we wanna share it with you. Um, but we are doing the virtual career fair that is listed second. Um, it is not up on our events calendar, at least as of um, May 12th when I'm recording this. I'm hopeful it will be up there soon. So if you see this in the next few days after the 12th and it's not there, know that it's coming. I did list the link um, there at the bottom to see all of our career events, which is um, where you will see that virtual career fair pop up soon. Um, but know that any virtual or in-person events that we are doing or that we have heard about, we put onto our events calendar. So keep a close eye on that link um, if you're looking for career programming anytime soon. All right, this is a brief end screen. It has my contact information. Um, you can call if you want and leave me a voicemail. I am happy to respond to it that way. Um, I am still checking my voicemail while, while away from campus. Um, email is probably the easiest way to reach me, but whatever you are most comfortable with um, works for me. And of course, you can always connect with the University Career Center as a whole um, through any manner of social media, too. If you have questions, please do reach out. My email is there for a reason. Um, I am very responsive right now to emails. Um, and I can usually get back to you within 24 hours, or I should say one business day. Thank you so much. I hope you found this helpful. Stay safe. Be well. See ya.